from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Carolyn Rupkevian, and we're here at the Library of Congress today. We've been enjoying the music of Zulal and Ara Dinkjen, and I'd like each of them to introduce themselves. I am part of Zulal, the Armenian a cappella trio. My name is Tenny. I'm Yaraz, also from Zulal. And I'm Anais. I'm Ara Dinkjan. So I want to ask all of you, what are your earliest memories of singing or playing or even hearing Armenian music? Who wants to go first? I don't remember a time when I didn't listen to Armenian music. I feel like it was playing in the car, playing in the home from when I was born. I don't remember a time when it started. I feel like it was always there. It was part of parties and we heard opera and we heard classical and we heard all different versions of it, but I don't remember a time when it began. I feel like it was always there. When did you start singing it? I think I started singing when I was about six or seven years old. Mm -hmm. um, and I stole some tapes from my dad's library and uh, I willed myself to learn these songs the way the singers were singing them. And I feel like I burned through these tapes um, to the point where my parents were just listening to the songs over and over again. Um, and I, uh, I think I started around that age, yeah. Anais, what, what about you? Um, I think it was, I'm no longer religious now, but as a child, because of my grandmother, I went to Armenian church and because I had a sweet little voice, they put me in the choir. And so I started singing there, I think from the age of 11 until I went off to college. So it was mostly liturgical. Mm -hmm. And Tenny? Mine was a, a mix of everything. We went to church every Sunday, so, you know, at that time, it wasn't like now I have a sort of a light version for my kids, we're in, we're out. But when I was a kid, it was a full two hour commitment. And I remember really attaching myself to the melodies and the rituals and all of those things combined. Um, the folk music probably came a little bit later or in school. And I don't really have a precise moment yeah. that it started, but yeah, here and there. And Ara? Yeah, for me, the, the most obvious answer is the fact that my father is Onig Dingchan, a, a very renowned Armenian folk singer. But uh, beyond that, like the ladies said, uh, Armenian music was, was in the house in that uh, we went to church, so there's the liturgical music. Uh, my parents sang in the choir. Uh, I eventually became the organist. Uh, all their uh, social activities revolved around uh, choruses and dance groups. Uh, and so there was rehearsals and there was concerts constantly. And when they socialized, when people came over, they just spontaneously started to sing in the house. So just like the lady said, uh, there was never a time when music was not in the house. And that's how we all grew up. Ara, right, you were saying uh, that your family was from De Granagert on your father's side and Harput on your mother's side. Right. And each of you, I, I haven't had a chance to ask you where your families were from originally. Do you know? Well, my, uh, I'm Armenian on my dad's side, and mm -hmm. I know that my grandmother's family was from Maintab. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm also half Dikrana Gertzi on my mom's side, and on my father's side, I'm Vanetti. My mom's father was from Adana, mm -hmm. and on the, my dad's side, it's Gesaria and Sepastia. It's a mix of a lot of things. So uh, I wondered, uh, I know in one of the songs that you sing, you sing in different dialects. How, how did you come to do that, and how did you research that? Well, we were speaking with Ara earlier about, you know, the beauty of music of the Caucasus and how different cultures have informed each other's music. But what's happened even within the Armenian folk is because the melodies were passed on orally, they usually weren't written, especially in the villages, uh, 
ideas and melodies ended up shifting a little every time it traveled, every time it went to a different place. So this was lucky. I mean, we listened to a lot of archival songs. So this happened to reveal itself to us, which was a little bit of luck and a little bit of collecting, of which Ara is much more the collector. But it happened to be that we found these, these three different archival melodies. And then the fourth one, which was uh, Haig Yazjan's Gago Mare. Um, it was, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. it was. So we ended up feeling the need to pair these, these melodies and we ended up through that research finding the different regions and figuring out the different dialects and putting it together. I, I think the question of dialects is a very important one mm -hmm. uh, because uh, many of them, if not most of them, are on the verge of being extinct. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in particular, for example, uh, there has not been an Armenian born in Dikran Agerd in over 50 years. And the absolutely unique dialect of Dikran Agerd, see Armenian, uh, when it's spoken in its purest form, th those of us who understand Armenian will not understand it. Um, so the fact that when the generation that, that knows it, uh, and they are now in their 80s and 90s, when they are gone, that dialect will cease to exist. Um, this is obviously a result of events from a hundred years ago, but it's also a product of the technology, how the world has gotten smaller, and uh, you are not just confined to your one area and your one way of speaking. So this is all just part of uh, the transitions in life, I guess. Ara, right, you're a collector of old recordings. How have these inspired your work? One of the reasons that I collect music is because uh, when I'm learning something, um, I want it to be, at least the foundation of it, to be as accurate as possible. Not that I want to copy it as if I, I'm some kind of a museum piece, but before you learn to interpret something, you should try to learn the, the, the origins of it. And frankly, the, the earliest sonic evidence we have of our music is in uh, if they're not on cylinders, then they are on the flat 78 RPM records. Uh, and so, I, since I was a young kid, I've been fanatically collecting them because there might be a fourth verse that simply people don't know anymore, or there may be an instrumental introduction to a piece that we simply don't do. Well, they're preserved there, and to me, these are cultural treasures. Do you incorporate that into your music sometimes? I or? absolutely do. Yeah. Uh, if, if I'm uh, performing a piece uh, that has existed for, let's say, 100 years, I go back to those recordings, again, not to try to copy them, but to be aware of them and in some cases, yes, incorporate them. As far as my own personal music is concerned, my own compositions, all of that has deeply influenced what I do. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned your father. Talk a little bit more about how he has influenced your musical style. Well, I, I learned uh, the, the, the folk music and the classical music uh, from the fact that uh, back when I was a kid, you didn't use babysitters. If there was chorus rehearsal, you take the kids with you. Uh, and there was every week. <laughs> so I wound up bored out of my mind because I want to play with a toy or something and I have to wait for two hours for this rehearsal to be over but without realizing it I learned all of this great rich repertoire uh, and also I would learn I would sit with my mother in the sopranos you know uh, and learn that part and then I would go sit with my father in the tenors and I'm learning that part but again kind of not realizing what a rich treasure this was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Some of your work is original work, too, a lot of your work. How, how do you go about creating your original pieces? Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't like to think of myself as a creator. I think that's very pompous. And I've found this phrase that more a accurately describes how I feel about that creative process, which is that I describe myself as a song finder. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, uh, the best songs come fully formed and you just hear them. You don't have to fix them. 
or add to them or edit them. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then it means they already exist somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, wow, I found this beautiful song. Uh, so that's how, that, how it comes to me, and sometimes it's in the shower, sometimes it's in the dream. Uh, my wife even knows sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night, turn a light on, and she doesn't anymore say, what are you doing? Because she knows he, he hears something and he's writing it down and then going back to sleep. So I, I don't want to take too much credit for it, but I, I, I'm lucky that I hear it sometimes. How do you find the material and how do you choose the material that you decide to sing? It's so complicated. I think we, similar to what Ara's talking about, we hear something in a song that speaks to us. And the songs that we choose are really the ones that touch us in some way. We sing these songs because we have to. We know that there's no choice. We, they're coming through us. We're holding on to them the best that we can. Uh, but they're sort of speaking to us through history. A lot of times we hear an old archival recording. Um, a lot of times we, sometimes we might hear uh, another performance by another artist of, a, of an old folk song, and there's something about it that speaks to us in some way. Um, I mean, for us, I feel like many things are about the balance of three. So it's not only the vocal blend, but it's also, you know, our different approach maybe to a harmony or what comes from, what's I think interesting about our group is that any one of us by ourselves are not anywhere near what we are together. And a lot of our song choices end up being revealed in that process because although we may be very different and we may have sort of a different idea of things, when it comes to music, all three of us will very clearly be able to define what, we, what is evocative and what speaks to us. So I feel like the music cuts through very clearly and when there's a song that maybe two of us like and one of us don't, then that means something. So we end up doing the things that, that speak to us across the trio and those end up being the ones that we're meant to do. And how do you work out your arrangements? How does that happen? Experimentation, very collectively, maybe. it's yeah. very much a, a it's process a <laughs> that we do together. It's a little bit like birthing a child as well, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we go through some trials and tribulations sometimes. Sometimes things come very easily and quickly. Each song has its own spirit in a way, and we follow it. And, and some and songs want us to sing them, and some don't. Yeah, there's there will be a song maybe that collectively we each individually love, and yet when we try to sing it together, something doesn't happen. And we ha we're sad, and we have to let that go. That song wasn't meant for us, for whatever reason. How has your music, or your thinking about music, evolved over the years? When I was younger, um, I wanted to, I, I'm a little embarrassed to say it, I wanted to show what I know, or what I can do. And uh, I, I no longer feel uh, that, that need now. I want to hit one note and have people say, oh, I love the oud. <laughs> Not necessarily I love the way he plays the oud, but oh, that's, I love that instrument. Uh, and ultimately, I'm looking for that perfect song, which will be one note. And people are going to say, yeah, he found it. He finally <laughs> found it. So uh, short answer, my, I think my music is becoming simpler. I don't know. I mean, our music is, like anyone's music, right, is an extension of themselves, their spirit, their relationship with each other and themselves. So for us, you know, within this trio, we've grown into women. We were girls when we started, and for us, the Zulal has been very much, you know, the, there's the music, and then there's like our, our relationship. And I think the, the music is very much, the evolution of the music is a rep representation of our journey together. We started when we were younger, and now we've gone through many evolutions personally within that time together, and the music, if anything, is a reflection of that. Can I ask a question? Absolutely, I was about to say, yes. Has motherhood affected your music? Of course. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> How can I not? How, in what way? Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, I know just as an artist, I know that I have developed a lot since becoming a mother. I feel like when I went back on stage after becoming a mother and living through grief before that and so forth, things had opened, it's a little bit perverse, but things had opened up in a way that I had to work at mm. before that. And I think that comes out in the voice too, mm. since, you know, for any musician or artist, it comes out in your work. Mm. Uh, but there's a, an openness and there, there's both a strength and an extra vulnerability that I don't think you necessarily yeah. have before experiencing a lot of life's big, mm. big experiences. Motherhood has also made me, and I'm sure for you guys it's the same, more grateful to be able to do this when you have given so much to your children and it's, you've experienced that, to be able to come and really sit inside this music and be able to share it with other people. There's, there's a new feeling of gratitude to be able to do that. And I think there's something about um, that makes me want to work harder at it. I'm giving up a lot. I'm leaving a lot at home, as we all are, to be here and to be doing this. And so we want to make it count every time. We want to make every song hit somebody in the heart or feel right for somebody or touch somebody in some way. We want to communicate what we're holding from our ancestors and to be able to relay that to someone somewhere sitting in the room and for them to feel that. And we want to be able to do that every time because we're giving up a lot to be here. And what about fatherhood? Fatherhood uh, inspired me to write uh, lullabies for my children and to uh, and think about uh, what I'm leaving them when I'm no longer here. Um, and uh, the older you get, the more you realize time is so precious. So you have to do things. You have to do them now. If, if there's things you want to accomplish, uh, don't procrastinate. It'll never be ready. It'll never be perfect you have to do it now because when you're gone, that's what you're leaving. So uh, yeah, uh, fatherhood changed, changed everything for me. Anything else in particular really changed what you do? Parenthood, obviously. Well, I think every event in our lives uh, affects, affects us. I mean, uh, as a composer, you, you know, I've always kind of uh, lamented the fact that uh, music used to be for a purpose. And what I mean by that is there was the song that you would sing to ask God to make it rain so that you can eat. Or there was the song that you sang when somebody died. Or there was the song that you sing to put your baby to, to sleep. We've kind of lost that in our society. Music has become something that you're on the stage, you're physically separated from your audience, they're doing something up there, and then when they're done, you express you know, yourself by clapping and then they go backstage and you... St That's not what music used to be. As a matter of fact, in some cultures, there's not even a word for music. It's just what they do when they're hunting. They sing these things. And I kind of lament the fact that we've, we've lost that. So um, I try to get that back in my own personal way, writing songs for a reason. You know, you're all very accomplished musicians, and I want to ask you why you have chosen to focus on folk music, Armenian folk music, as, as what you do. We tried other genres, didn't we? Briefly. In the very beginning, we've been doing this over 10 years now together, and we tried, we experimented with different styles of music, if I remember, and it was something, when I say that we sing these songs because we have to, there was something about the folk music and just imagining that, as Ara said, people created music for a purpose and also to express themselves and to express what was happening for them in that moment, whether it was grief, whether it was joy, whether it was struggle or hardship or love or yearning, whatever it was, they used music and song and voice to express that. And so there was something about that quality of communicating what was happening for you internally in your soul and to be able to share that with somebody. There was something about that that spoke to us and we couldn't do anything else. I don't know that it was a choice. Yeah. Also for us there's something very unifying about it because we settled on, on, on Armenian folk music for a reason, being of all, all of at least part Armenian extraction. And, um, but we're all a very different aesthetics. We have 
different aesthetics in general, visual and, and even in terms of what we like to listen to outside of Armenian music, but somehow we came together and we meld our different styles into this thing that works. We've created our own, our own little thing that, that is just, it works for us. And, and somehow Armenian folk was the unifying element for, for the three of us. Mm -hmm. For myself, I would never impose what I'm about to say on anybody else, but for me, the brain is the great enemy of music. And uh, what I mean by that is um, music touches me the most when I'm not conscious of it, when, I'm, when it's touching my heart as opposed to stimulating my brain. Um, and so if, if that's true, I can tell you that I responded, even as a little boy, I physically and emotionally responded to Armenian folk music without understanding why or anything. And I want to give you a specific example. I always found myself gravitating towards these folk songs in the 10-8 time signature. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I made the connection that, wait a minute, my ancestors are from Dikranagerd and Harpert, and 10-8 is the, is the beat there. And I know that that is not a coincidence, that it is, uh, I'm carrying the genetic blood of my ancestors. And instead of intellectualizing it, my body and soul just responded to it, and it confirms that you, you need to trust your, your, your heart, even if you don't understand why you think that girl is pretty, or why you don't like that food, or whatever, you need to trust what your body and soul is telling you because all of that history is, is inside of you. And so that, that's what I trust. I want to ask all of you also, is, is there something else that you would like to talk about that I haven't asked you? Mm. Well, I'm never at a loss for words. I'm sorry. If I'm <laughs> Go <correct>. for it. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to mention that uh, we had a rehearsal last week and um, I told the girls that not only, of course, I admire what they do and I like what they do, but I, I wanted them to understand that uh, they can't minimize their accomplishments because they don't know who they're reaching and what effect that's having. Um, their CDs can be copied and, and travel all around the world and somebody somewhere is listening and it's changing somebody's lives. So that's not to say that they should have a big head, but it was my way of, of, of telling them that there are influencing younger generations um, by doing something that is firmly rooted in their history and yet is fresh and contemporary and very positive. And I, I think that's a, 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 great, uh, a great service that they're giving back to their great history. Ara, talk about playing in Turkey on April 24th this year. It was a decision that actually came uh, quite easy uh, for me because uh, to go to the land where the atrocities were held, I think in some ways is more powerful than you know, in America we are geographically and therefore emotionally kind of isolated. There's something going on over there across the ocean. There's some, we don't know, we don't feel it, we don't even understand it. Um, but to be there uh, was of course emotional, but I think most importantly, there are Turks, Kurds, and of course Armenians that know the history and that are anxious to reveal what they know, and in many cases uh, to great danger for themselves, for their lives, not us here in America, but for them because they live there. Uh, because they know that um, the truth, while it is uh, at times very painful and ugly, uh, it's really our only hope. And for me it would be unconscionable not to support the risk that they're taking to say, yes, there was a genocide, and 
we need to, we need to face that and then we need to move forward. Um, I, I needed to go there and support those who are putting their own lives at risk for our cause. I say our cause, but the very fact that they're doing it means they understand it's not an Armenian Turkish issue. It is a humanity issue that in some cases, for example, the Kurds are now living through all over. Uh, and so it was vital to be there and emotional beyond, beyond words. And you were playing uh, with other musicians of uh, different backgrounds, is that? Absolutely, they, they were, everybody was represented on the stage. Uh, and and that's, that's what it's got to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that concert. Well, uh, the concert was uh, in Istanbul and it was a four hour concert and it was attended by I think over 5,000 people. It was uh, broadcast live throughout the world uh, and there were, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, over a hundred different uh, artists, singers, uh, and everybody was represented. When I say everybody, uh, Armenians of course, but also Turks and Kurds, and as well as Europeans and, and everybody kind of uh, uniting to say that again, it's not a Turkish-Armenian issue, it's a, it's a human issue that we need to uh, resolve so that we can prevent it from happening again. Uh, and everybody was uh, really put their egos to the side uh, and, uh, and perform from their heart. And I know I was, uh, I was very proud to be part of that. Uh, and I hope, I hope the world was watching uh, because sometimes uh, who history teaches you is your enemy. Uh, if you get to know them, they might not be your enemy. They might actually want to be working with you. Uh, and I think it's very important to, to keep those, uh, those doors open uh, because actually you can, you can accomplish more that way than remaining uh, isolated. And that concert was, uh, I think, the perfect example of that. And it was recorded? Was it was uh, recorded. Actually, you could go on YouTube and watch the whole four-hour concert. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, yeah, and it, the concert is called In Memoriam. Uh, so I think you can YouTube that and watch the whole concert and there's a, an array of stars uh, again from around the world uh, and, and so many different languages uh, were represented but all for that united message that uh, we have to somehow as a species prevent these things from happening again. You know our music crosses borders in, in many ways um, historically um, just because we were the crossroads of cultures and um, because of our, our recent history. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about um, influences back and forth in, in your music or in the folk music. It's best done looking at a, a piece of music across mm -hmm. different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, Sari Gyalin is one, Sari Akhchik, which you have in Iran, there's a Turkish version, there's an Azeri version, there's an Armenian version. I mean, I feel like in a way, the music is, is the clearest example of this idea is, I mean, we were speaking about this earlier backstage. Yes, you can take a melody and then you can have uh, 10 different cultures arguing as to, uh, you know, what is the origin of this melody? And it's, uh, it, it can get serious, but in the end, it's, it, it can get silly also. Uh, really, I think, for us to be an Armenian is just to have a sense of, of your history and what your obligation towards that history into the future is all about. Um, if you asked about specifically uh, influences you know, in, in our music, uh, just speaking on behalf of myself, um, the mere fact that I'm born in America, uh, well, that changes everything. Uh, and just to get a little specific, I hope it's not boring, um, you know, Armenian folk music uh, does, not, uh, does not employ harmony traditionally. Uh, and it employs um, microtone, microtonal modes, et cetera, et cetera. Harmony is a Western European concept. Mm -hmm. So my life's work is how do I wed the microtonal ancient modes 
with Western harmony, because I'm born in America, I can't ignore that part of who I am. I'm an American. How do I wed those in a way that neither is offended and both are, are elevated? It's a, uh, it's a challenge, and it's a challenge that is my life's work, and it's, I, I treasure trying to accomplish that. Some cases it succeeds, some cases it doesn't. But then we have the Zulal Trio, who are singing Armenian folk melodies with rich, deep harmonies. And the interesting thing, if you don't mind me saying this, uh, is that uh, especially with Gomidas, he established and defined and declared that there is a unique thing called Armenian harmony, which is different than Georgian or Bulgarian or Western European or what have you. Uh, and the girls are a great example of, of uh, helping to define that. Just this idea of being in America and, and all three of us saying a cappella in ensemble form in college. And yet, Anais was in a Slavic a cappella choir. I was in a sort of modern pop a cappella group. And Tenny was in a jazz a cappella ensemble. And so, just even our own musical upbringings, and of course, more diverse than just that. Um, but just even coming from a harmony point of view, it also brings in all of those pieces. Again, we, you know, we were born and raised here, all three of us. And we're reaching back through time to try to elevate or, or connect with this music in a way and be true to who we are at the same time. So, I mean, I, everything Ara is saying, I agree with. I just want to add one more thing to this idea of, of music across cultures. So we got an email a couple days ago, I don't know if you saw it, from a guy in Turkey who yes. said, your music, you know, it was, in, it was in kind of funky English, and it said, your music touches me or makes me feel something the same way our Turkish folk music yes. does, in the yes. same way. And he said, you know, you're welcome here. I personally welcome you to come. But in a way, it, it touches back to what Ara was saying about trying to find simplicity. And I think what's, you know, the, the truth behind this music moving across peoples and cultures is that when it's right, it touches the most simple parts of us that are the same across countries and ethnicities. And so real folk music, I think, really is borderless because it evokes something that in the part of us that is human. So what are you all thinking about for the future now? I mean, beyond getting simpler and simpler. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the John Cage of folk music. <laughs> <laughs> Until there's nothing left. <laughs> well, we're working on our third album, uh, which will be titled Seven Springs. And we're close to wrapping it up. We uh, have finished off a bunch of songs, and, and we're just sort of recording the last few pieces. So should be out soon, that's our big thing. And we're performing in Germany at a music festival. Our, our hope is to travel more outside of the US. One of our dreams has been uh, to travel back to our historic lands and do one-on-one -on -one, you know, archival collecting of songs to meet those people that are still there and are still singing those songs, however old they are. And if they can remember the words, we'll be all the more grateful for it, and if they can remember the melodies. But that's been one of our dreams for a long time, is to be able to continue to collect it and maybe save a few more songs that haven't already been recorded. Ara, what are you dreaming about still uh, doing? My dreams have all been fulfilled, and, and, and then again some. Uh, and if I have any more, it would be to to continue, I have all these projects in my mind. I've done so many projects and been so fortunate to have realized them. And if I can continue and do more at this point, it's uh, for me the cherry on the cake. Um, I'm just grateful for whatever I've been able to experience so far. I think we just still have a lot more to express in, in the same line of what we've, we've been doing, but it does evolve with time, with who we become musically, things change subtly maybe to other people's ears but we know how things are changing for us and that's that's always exciting the more the more things start to happen for us creatively the more things start to happen and that's a it's a fun place to be in and you will go to the historic lands and sing. you will it would oh. feel amazing
That would be amazing. We believe a lot in, you know, the muses and the things higher than us that control our ability to find songs and all of those things. So we just pray that they keep <laughs> giving us that ability, really. Thank you very much, Zulal and Ara Dingshan. We're here at the American Folk Life Center of the Library of Congress. It is May 28th, and we've enjoyed music and conversation. Thank you again. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.